Hi, I am Michelle Tafoya coming to you live from Tokyo, and this is Studio A. This is the home of Tokyo Live on NBC Universal's Peacock Streaming Service. I'll say that again Peacock Streaming Service. If you don't have it, you really should go get it. Because from 6 to 11 a.m. each morning on Peacock, Tokyo Live will present live coverage of some of the day's Olympic stories. It's going to be fantastic. But really, the reason you're tuning in today is these three people here on the sofa. Pete, Georgetown Law, 1997. Congratulations. <laughs> Molly, School of Foreign, of, of Foreign Service, Class of 90. Molly Solomon, Pete Bavakwa, and Gary Zinkel. Georgetown Law, 87. 87? Yeah. 97. 90. 90. 87, 97. We've got a, like a generation of... <laughs> I graduated uh, law school when I was 15. <laughs> you were one of those. Yeah. And I graduated from college when I was 17. There you go. I was 13. And you? Uh, I was a little older. <laughs> I had no idea until I was asked to moderate this that we had so much Georgetown sort of you know, royalty here in the hierarchy, the, the, the top of NBC Sports, but here you are. Um, I mean, how much do you, does that still resonate with you guys? Like when you see each other in the hallways or around here, are you like Hoya, Hoya love? We do talk about it because when, when Pete came to NBC, the first thing I looked up, I was like, wait, he's a Hoya. And same thing, Gary and I go way back, but I must say, Michelle, I'm the only true Hoya because I went undergrad to Georgetown, but I also don't have a legal. We're uh, we're Hoya lawyers. <laughs> there it is. Hoya lawyers. Yes. All right, and we're here in Tokyo. We've all been here a handful. Well, Molly, how long have you been here now? I've been here almost two weeks. Okay. What are the impressions, Gary? Let's start with you. Well, it's uh, to start probably the best prepared Olympic city that I think, and mm -hmm. Molly and I have been to the same number of them. Uh, that we've ever seen. Really? Now, of course, they did have an extra year, but they were this prepared in March of 2020. So that's a huge advantage, especially for our operation, because we move a lot of stuff in, and when it's ready and you don't have to wait for them to finish, uh, it makes our jobs a lot easier. So that's one. Uh, so the city is, is ready to host an Olympics. Um, obviously, we're in an interesting environment with, with COVID and uh, some significant restrictions on how we operate, how we move around, and that is different for all of us. But so far, uh, we're ready. Uh, I know Molly could talk about this, but production-wise, uh, we're ready to go. How many Olympic Games will this be for you? Thirteen. 13. And for you, Molly Solomon? Actually, 11. I miss Sochi and Pyeongchang. Okay. So you got me beat. She was, she was busy with the Golf Channel. Yes. Um, or Golf Channel. What am I supposed to say? Golf Channel? Golf Channel. Golf Channel. She was busy with Golf Channel. <laughs> but now she's back, and everyone's very grateful because Molly Solomon has uh, Olympic chops like no other. What, it, what stood out to you so far uh, what, outside of the preparation? What stands out to me is just the all of these extraordinary circumstances really mean that this could be one of the most meaningful Olympics of, of I think, our lifetimes, because this really is the world coming together for the first time since the pandemic began. And think about all of these athletes um, who have trained a lifetime for the Olympics, and they weren't sure it was going to happen. And it is going to happen, and it's going to be complex. It's ambitious, but the important part, I think, for all of us is to focus on the athletes. There may not be fans in the stands, but we are the way that America is going to see the Olympics and see their feet. So um, we just feel really privileged that we're here and that there actually is going to be an Olympics. Pete, this is your first Olympic Games. They don't all go this way. You know, they're not all this wacky. But what has sort of <laughs> struck you about the whole experience so far? Well, for me, I mean, to be a part of the NBC team and have this be my first Olympics, it's been pretty spectacular. And having this extra year to, to prepare. I've been lucky enough, I was in Beijing as a guest of NBC, I was in Sochi as a guest of NBC, and then I was in Rio as part of the golf movement. But when I came to NBC, this was something I had circled, knowing we were going to be in Tokyo for the summer games. Obviously, it's different having had this year, but uh, I've been so impressed, Michelle. You can feel things and read things on paper, but to see the team, the way it's been prepared, the operation here, just the magnitude of the operation, 
and how unbelievably well organized it is. And when you think about people like Gary and Molly that have more Olympic experience than literally anybody in the world, yeah. uh, we're, we're certainly in good hands. But I think Molly's right. I think this really has the potential to be something special. It can be a celebration for the world after coming out of this prolonged hibernation that we've all been in. I think the world really needs an Olympics now, maybe more than ever. I think that's a really interesting point. And it's odd. I hear so much or her back in the States, no fans. What's that going to be like? No spectators. And it does kind of make it different for the whole business and the whole approach. And I'm wondering, Gary, how that aspect of it has affected the way we're going to be covering the games. I'll tell you what, I'm going to pitch this to Molly, but uh, I think early on, actually, when the decision was made that overseas travelers couldn't come, so we knew we were going to have fewer fans, and what we knew at that time was we weren't going to have the families of American athletes because they were not allowed to travel, we began to develop and surface ideas around how could we connect with the families that were staying at home, not just to connect with them as <clears throat> supporters of the team, but also connect them with their kids or their friends or their uh, siblings. Uh, the plans have been developed. I think we doubled and tripled down a bit to the extent we've been able since the decision of last week to eliminate all fans. But uh, Molly, they're quite extensive. Yeah, and, and we knew early on, as Gary alluded to, that there were not going to be international fans. So our mission became let's bring America to Tokyo. Because if you watch the Olympics, you know how important, you know, the narrative is you were at swimming trials and you cut away to the parents, the coaches, the sisters, the brothers in the stands. Well, we're going to cut away to the families at home. And so we're going to have watch parties really across the United States, including in Orlando, Florida, where the U.S. Olympic Committee is offering for families to come there and watch and feel that community. So we think we're going to hear USA, USA. But it, it's really important for that. And, and so really we want to connect um, the athletes here to their friends and family. And in some cases, you may be talking to an athlete and their family and making that narrative connection right. for them. So we really think it's vital. But I also think there's an opportunity for NBC to present the games like never before, because if there aren't fans, we are going to really bring you the aggress an aggressive mix of sounds of the game. Imagine the thrashing in the swimming pool, the grinding of wheels um, in the skateboard venue. So we really think it could be um, an interesting experience for the audience. And I would say, Michelle, I mean, you lived it. You saw it with Sunday Night Football. I mean, you love when you have the spectators there, but there was an intimacy yeah. mm -hmm. to Sunday Night Football, and you could hear things, whether it was the audibles at the line of scrimmage that you otherwise couldn't hear. So I think, you know, under Molly's leadership, kind of really introducing the viewing public to these athletes with a sense and a level of intimacy that maybe was never before possible could be pretty special. It, it, it really does. I mean, things that are challenging offer opportunities, and I think we have some good ones here. I just want to make sure that people understand when you said the grinding of the skateboard wheel, that's a new sport this year. We got baseball and softball back, thank goodness. But tell us a little bit about the new sports and something maybe that excites you most about them. What I think is it, it's it's a terrific move by the International Olympic Committee to keep um, bringing in new sports into the Olympic movement because that's what youth are doing. Yeah. So what you're going to see for the first time here is surfing is an Olympic sport, skateboarding, sport climbing. You should see the sport climbing wall um, and karate along with softball and baseball coming back. So I always look back at, if you recall, in 1998, um, the Winter Olympics re Introduced, well, introduced um, snowboarding into yeah. the Olympics. And at the time, everyone's like, oh, the, you, you, yeah. the youth are not going to embrace the Olympics. This isn't the apex winning a gold medal in snowboarding. Now it's one of the core sports of the entire Olympics. So I think there's so much opportunity here to, to bring these um, sports into the Olympics. It's going to be really interesting, I think, that fan experience of the, the younger and the older um, um, coming together. There's a couple of 13-year-olds in skateboarding who are Olympians. I mean, that's <laughs> I, I can't wait to see what they do. So 1964 here in Tokyo was NBC's first uh, Olympic Games coverage. This, which is 2020 in 2021, the 2020 Games, however, NBC's 17th Olympic Games and second of three consecutive in Asia. So there was 2018 in Pyeongchang. We're here. And 2020, I mean, literally 2022, right around the corner in Beijing. Like, you guys are here. 
and you're working on Tokyo, but Beijing has got to be right there in the front of your mind too, isn't it? Yeah. We, we actually have people who have been here for months, our technical logistics team, and they will go straight from here to Beijing to be able to essentially uh, catch all of the equipment because mm -hmm. we'll box our equipment up in containers and move them right there. Uh, so it's, it's a continuous operation, actually something that we have not done before. Uh, but be, the postponement also, a la I mean, it, it created the, 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 the conflict, if it's a conflict, or at least pushing the two games together. But it also gave us an opportunity to figure out how to plan these things. And then, mm -hmm. of course, we have a Super Bowl uh, in the middle of the Beijing Olympics just to throw a little cherry on the top of the complexity. Yeah, I mean, yeah. We, we joke internally. I mean, it's, it's without a doubt not just the busiest stretch in the history of NBC Sports when you think about Tokyo everything we otherwise normally do, the Beijing Olympics right around the corner, the L.A. Super Bowl yeah. smack dab in the middle of it. But not only the busiest time in the history of NBC Sports, but maybe the busiest time in the history of any sports group. Yeah. But if you can't get charged up and excited about that, we should probably all be <laughs> doing something different, right? But we are all charged up and excited. It's, it's going to be phenomenal. But in terms of importance to the company, Pete, what do the Olympics mean? What kind of impact do they have on this company? Yeah, I think it is one of the backbones, part of the DNA of Comcast and NBC Universal. Uh, you know, Brian Roberts will be here with us, Jeff Schell. And what's so impressive is to see the way everybody rallies around the Olympics, whether it's our news division, and Molly could tell you about the Today Show being here, and Lester Holt and Nightly News, the way everybody in our entertainment division is rallying around this. It's 17 days where NBC comes together and says, okay, let's push this forward. This is the biggest thing we have going. There's nothing quite like the Olympics. And we talk about symphony internally, mm -hmm. and that's kind of our secret ingredient to success when NBC rallies around something. And I don't think there's any greater or more powerful example of that than, than during the Olympics. And in terms of the brand, I, mean, I, I, I don't know if I'm asking the same question twice, but it does seem to me that that peacock and the Olympic rings kind of go together more than, you know. For a generation, yeah. really. And I always look at the Olympics as being the original miniseries, right? It's, it's before reality TV ever was a thing. It's 17 straight nights. You don't know what's going to happen. You get to know the characters, and then you, you're sad when it's over. But this time, we only have six months until the next Olympics. <laughs> you don't be sad too long. <laughs> you and plus, know. we've got the football in there, too. That by little the, Sunday night football. By the way, worth noting, that we also come out of an Olympics, and two weeks later we start the Paralympics. Right, right. And we have increased the amount of coverage around the Paralympics, games to games, over the last couple. We will have primetime coverage of the Paralympics on four different, three different nights, four hours. And so uh, one of the pushes Molly will do towards the end of the Olympic Games is to begin to tee up the stories of the Paralympics. Oh, and those stories are some of the are most amazing, amazing yeah. you're ever going to hear. So that's, you know, the continuous operation is... Olympics, into Paralympics, into Beijing, Super Bowl, another Paralympics, and then, uh, and then the championship and then season. And then Paris. <laughs> 7,000 hours of programming is a lot. Yeah. Uh, biggest media event ever? I mean, that's how it's being built. How Absolutely. do we convince people that, yeah, 7,000 hours is the biggest media event ever? It's, it's inescapable. I, you know, I was going back and we were talking, I think Rio was 6,750 hours. We're now at 7,000 hours, but it's, it's everywhere across NBC. Mm -hmm. Whether you're watching USA, CNBC, MSNBC, now our streaming service and Peacock and what we're going to do around Peacock, but it's exciting. And to bring these stories to life the way Molly can do it with, the, with our team and to, and to have this celebration and to really spread it across NBC. So whatever your sport might be, whatever your passion might be, we can bring it to you as it's happening. And that there's nothing like that. It's, it's a challenge because everyone's experience of viewing things now is a little bit different. You just need to know a teenager to understand that and, or any young kid. Um, and so how have you sort of adapted the Olympic 
picture to, to those different platforms mm -hmm. that really are reaching different people. No, you're correct. And you're a mom to teenagers, so you know they're not going to watch it the same way we are. So we really have adapted to the changing habits of the consumer. And so if you're, I'm not going to say old fashioned, but if you depend on linear, you can come to primetime and get the ultimate curated live swimming gymnastics in prime time, if you're the super fan like Pete mentions and you want to watch the U.S. women's soccer team, we've got that for you on USA Network. Meanwhile, everything is streaming on NBCOlympics.com and the NBC Sports app. And then Gary can talk about how we're not limited just to NBC Universal platforms. We go to where the kids are. <laughs> We go to where the audience that's, is. That's Gary's always where the cool kids are. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's the shorts. Yeah, that's right. That's the shorts. Um, right, so we have been through the years working with uh, content platforms, social media platforms. I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's extended even beyond those. Knowing that there's an audience out there that either isn't going to watch linear or needs a little bit of a nudge. And... The key to those platforms is that you produce it with a sensibility that appeals directly to that audience. Right. And so we're smart enough to know where we're going to be effective on our own and where we need the platform or even third parties to help us create the content. And we are, you know, I don't have to name them. They're obvious, uh, but we're in all of them. I will name one which we hadn't worked with prior is Twitch. So Twitch is a bit of a phenomenon, especially among young males um, and females, but males especially. Uh, it's a gaming community, and they are so excited to be involved with the Olympics. They will have a studio in this structure. They'll have a couple other programs that are uh, hosted out of Stanford, and they will be bringing their streamers and interacting with our content with athletes as they walk through here. Um, and creating a lot of interest and buzz. Will some of them move over to linear? I don't know. I think more of them will than would have had we not done that. Right. But if they choose to stay there and that's where the Olympics is relevant to them, that's good for us. We're, you know, we've got this well into the future uh, and we will continue to you know, deliver content, Olympic content to fans everywhere. We'll monetize to the extent that's possible, which it is. And we'll be ready for them on any platform when they choose to shift. I mean, the, the opportunities are endless. Yep. Biggest storylines. There's a lot of attention right now on USA Basketball on the men's side because we've had some health issues and so forth. Um, there's a story in track and field that some people are very upset. About. So where, where do you envision the biggest storylines and how do we make sure we're not overdoing the COVID stuff at the expense of, look how remarkable all of this is? Well, once you get to the games and the games begin, it's about the athletes, and of course, we're going to be addressing anything that touches them and, and how this is all going to play out. But in terms of storylines, it's like picking your children, which one you love the best, Michelle. But uh, I'll, Oh, I'll, come on. You've I'll, got triplets. You can okay, tell so us. I get three stories. You get can three stories. Story? Yes, that's perfect. Um, I think Simone's your favorite child. Well, I, <laughs> She's Simone, Simone Biles is extraordinary. Yeah. And the fact that you get to see the GOAT, the greatest of all time, yeah. and you get to see her multiple times, right? She's part of the U.S. women's gymnastics team. Then she goes to the all-around and competes for her individual medal, and then hopefully she'll be involved in four event finals. So that carries over like through the first 10 days of the Olympics. So to watch the GOAT, and it's our job to tell you why she's so amazing. So can't wait for Simone. And in the pool, we have another GOAT. Her name's Katie Ledecky. Yeah. And to see her continue <laughs> to compete at this high level even after another year, and she's 24 just like Simone. This is extraordinary. Yeah. Michael Phelps showed us it was possible with this longevity, but she's got a um, competitor who from down under, and there's this really great rivalry brewing between Ariana Titmus of Australia and Katie Ledecky. So it's going to be really interesting in the pool. Okay, then I have to pick one more, and this is really hard. Um, but I'm going to talk about the, the U.S. women's teams. They have actually won more medals, the U.S. women, than the U.S. men over the last four Olympics, just saying. <laughs> uh, but when you, you mentioned the U.S. men's basketball team, I want to talk about the U.S. women's basketball team. They're going for their seventh straight gold medal. That's I mean, crazy. that's... That's, That's extraordinary. And then you have the U.S. women's soccer team. I mean, they're one of the most popular, yes. well-known teams in all of U.S. professional sports, and they're trying to back up that World Cup win with a gold medal. And it's water polo, it's rowing, it's beach volleyball, it's volleyball, I could go on and on. And then there's also the U.S. track team, but I'll give that to you. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> United States of Speed, one of the best track teams I think we have seen and anticipated in a long time. It's so exciting. And yeah. I, I just want to ask you two about something that I think is going to be really cool. And that's the, the, the mixed relays yes. now in swimming and in track. So I first saw one in at a world championships where they had men and women, two men, two women compete in this mixed medley relay swim. It was the most entertaining thing. And I thought, why are, isn't this in the Olympics? Mm -hmm. And now we've got it, it as, as well as one with track, right? As tracks. Tracking and swimming. And what you say, what's so fascinating, first it's the collaboration, the teamwork, yeah. them cheering each other on, but it's also the strategy. Yes. Because mm. which strokes do you have the, you know, okay, who's your strongest breaststroker, male or female? Right. And then who do you want bringing it home? Right. And so to watch all this, and we're keeping score back, you know, in our control, which are like, who do you think they're going to pick? Like, we're going to actually have Steve Kornacki break <laughs> that down. <laughs> Steve Kornacki from NBC News will be joining NBC. The Olympics and he's going to break down the different legs and it's the same thing in track and field so I completely agree with you it's going to be fascinating aren't you glad that's part of it now absolutely and by the way this is an audience that is historically and will again be more female than male yeah it's a very non-traditional mm -hmm. sports audience and I think because it's bigger than doing sports, some yeah. non-traditional yeah. sports things is probably going to be really really engaging watch for those really you're going to love them it's amazing. We're here. We're in Tokyo, Pete. But there is a really, I think, maybe the heartbeat of this operation back stateside in Stamford. And this developed yeah. partly out of the necessity. But it, talk about just how this is going to, how these two sides are going to work. Well, it really was born out of necessity. And we, I kind of feel like you think back to March of 2020, we were in the middle of the Players' Championship. And everything came to a grinding halt because of COVID and sports shut down. And when sports came back, led by the PGA Tour and NASCAR, we immediately had to start doing more remotely. So we've kind of gone through these repetitions to prepare us for coming here and mm -hmm. doing something as big and as massive as the Olympics. But normally, whereas we would have over 3,000 people here in Tokyo, we have a team of about 1,700 people back in Stanford. We have people in Stanford. We have people at 30 Rock in New York. We're going to have people in our Telemundo offices down in Miami. Obviously, we'll be about 1,500 strong here. And I think it takes a complex plan and just adds layers of complexity yeah. to it. But we have to do it that way. And I think what will be great is for the viewer out there, it'll come across as seamless. And a perfect example is what we're living right now. We're having the Open Championship mm -hmm. over at Royal St. George's in England. But we're doing it out of Stamford, Connecticut. And if you're just tuning in and watching it, I don't think you'd ever really know. And that's a credit to our team and the preparation. And, uh, you know, the pandemic was difficult for so many people, obviously, both, you know, professionally, personally, lives lost. But we've learned some tough lessons over the course of it that will continue forward and I think make us better and stronger as we move out of this. Anything to add? Because this is really, this is new. It's it's new. Fortunately, we started doing some stuff at home in the past. We have some incredibly brilliant engineers. So we had some of what we tested and solidified over the course of the last year working uh, from games to games. Nothing like what we're going to experience right. here. Um, but fortunately, between some of the prior Olympic remote work and all of the remote work that happened over the course of the year, we're really confident that we can handle the complexity. All right. I want to make sure I didn't, because we're going to get to some Georgetown uh -huh. questions here before we let them go. Anything that I've missed that you want to make sure that we're talking about here before we go on to Georgetown memories? Have we covered it all? I, we haven't covered. We haven't even begun to cover. It. I mean, we've got seven thousand <laughs> hours to produce. Yeah. Let's just extend this for a few hours and sit here. <laughs> um, I. I I think you've got it. Uh, I, but I do think we need to talk about the opening ceremony. Okay. Because it, I mean, it is so symbolic of the world starting to emerge. By no means are we past it. But this will be truly the first time the world comes together is for that opening ceremony. So it's symbolic. It's meaningful in so many different ways. So if you ask me what I'm most looking forward to is seeing that cauldron finally be led. I think it's going to be incredibly emotional. How about the built-in air conditioning in the... Uh team jackets. 
every, you mean Mike Tirico's jacket too. Yeah. My, Seriously? <laughs> Mike Tirico <laughs> is going to, our primetime host, Mike Tirico, his, uh, his set is actually outdoors, you guys. Because primetime is yeah. very hot. In the morning, so he's got, I think they've taken out the lining. I shouldn't be saying this, I think. I think they're taking out his lining of his suit jackets and they're putting like tech fabric to help cool because like the athletes, they're wearing things to stay cool and so is our own Mike Tarika. This is the kind of information you only get right here at this very <coughs> specially produced Georgetown <laughs> special. All right, favorite Georgetown memory. Well, my favorite Georgetown memory in retrospect was my worst Georgetown memory at the time. But as life goes on, you learn to appreciate it. First year of law school, and I went to law school, I shouldn't admit this because I did no idea what I wanted to do with my life. But I liked being a student and I said, hey, I'm going to go to law school and I ended up loving law school. First class, first year, property taught by the dean of the law school, Professor McCarthy. And you're kind of, you hear these horror stories that he's going to call on you once a year, once a semester, and you have to stand up and he'll keep you there for the full hour, peppering you with questions. So everybody's dreading that. First class, literally the first class of law school, I go in there, he said, Mr. Bavacqua, and like a cold sweat came over my body. And I stood up and he goes, I'm going to use you as the foil to prove that none of you know anything about the law. And he said, name the Supreme Court justices. <laughs> and I think I named six of them. And then he was asking me this question and that question. So I kind of just did the rope-a-dope for an hour, sat down. People were like, oh, my God, are you okay? <laughs> but, but, you know, I was, I was a nervous wreck, but I was like, okay, I'm done. Thank God. Like, I can relax now. About a month later, now I'm kind of arrogant in class because I can't get called on anymore. And I'm sitting there kind of just, you know, like wondering who the poor person is who's going to get called. He goes, Mr. Bavacqua. <laughs> and I'm like, I thought it was a joke. And I stood back up and he goes, just, just, just to prove to everybody you can get called on twice. Ooh. And he Ooh. asked me like two questions and I got them and he goes, okay, sit down. So that was a learning moment for me. It was this is why I never went to, never was, went to law school. This is the Socratic law school method at its finest and its most Ooh. intimidating. But I lived through it and I ended up becoming friends with him and it all turned out okay. Things turned out pretty well for Pete Pavacqua, but just hearing that oh, gave so me a little bit of a heart attack. Scary. Can I just draft a little bit off of yes, that story? Please. So 10 years prior, because uh, I was attending Georgetown Law School first day, same story, not with me, uh, contracts class, Professor Gordon, we all been a little bit warned, 125 people, and he says nothing except, Mr. Brady, please stand up. That's not me. We, he, we, we reviewed a case that we were told we had to read. Nobody knew what they were reading or yeah. how to read a case. And Mr. Brady, and I forget his first name, but I remember. It wasn't was Tom. It? it was not Tom. <laughs> he was a Michigan guy. So, um, he stood there for the whole class, got drilled, couldn't answer a question. And, and when the class ended, he said, Mr. Brady, we will begin Thursday's class with you. Uh, Any event. So we all have a little bit of those stories. Any, uh, all, all, all went well. Did Mr. Brady Here's survive? My... I just, I'm worried about Mr. Brady. I haven't seen Mr. Brady in okay. 35 years, but I okay. assume he did. Yes. Okay. Um, my story is I played inter we played intramural co-ed football in law school. And the gym, which had, mm -hmm. on the, what was it, McDonough? McDonough. On the top of McDonough was a field, I think it was also a track. We're playing a game, and I'm a New Yorker, huge New York Nick fan my entire life. And I turn around, and there's a guy watching our game. It's Patrick Ewing. <laughs> true, true story. He's just standing up against a railing. Uh, so that was a great moment. That is a great yeah, moment. Did he know. ever participate? Did he, he did not. He didn't post you up or anything? He did not. Yeah. Darn. That's right. my favorite Georgetown That's, story. That's, That's not a bad one. one. That's a good one. <laughs> All right, true. Um, the, I, the only Hoy on the real well, Hoy here. I always got, I loved, um, you know, intellectually, education-wise, I loved the school foreign service. My dad was always mad, though. I refused to take the foreign service exam because I knew I wanted to be a sports journalist. So we were always at odds over that. But my, my, my memories always go to my best friends and my group. We lived together for two, actually, and a half years, but the half is too long a story to tell. But two things. Um, first, we lived on 1312 36th Street, right across from Holy Trinity, right across from the church where JFK got married. 
and on Saturday mornings we did bagels and brides. So we set up chairs and we watched the brides and the bridesmaids come out, drank mimosas, and graded the dresses. So okay, it that's became awesome. kind of a thing. <laughs> and then finally, and. Uh, my our senior year we lived just down the street from the tombs which both of you guys sure. would know and so we made a promise that we were going to go a hundred straight nights to the tombs and it was a really it was a hard burden it was long hard and arduous but we did it and so a hundred straight nights That's of drinking. Impressive. See what we missed Pete? Uh, so you should have gone <laughs> undergrad to Georgetown. Nobody Town. mentioned the exorcist stuff. Yeah see that, that's my favorite All I right. stayed on the, in the Georgetown dorms when I did a, a, a summer long Cal in the Capitol, Cal Berkeley in the Capitol, and everyone had to make their pilgrimage to, to those steps. exorcist steps. Yeah. It was cool. I hadn't seen the exorcist yet. So uh, then I had to, to go had to watch it. it. Is there anything from uh, tombs notwithstanding, a um, <laughs> hundred straight nights, although that could be something that's relatable to the Olympics because you gotta like just did, go did day, you after, stop day after day after day. Did did you keep going? Yeah. I weighed about a, a uh, no, I graduated and get, went to work for NBC. No, and so, <laughs> I had my my interview for NBC during senior week, so there were kegs all Night on a roof. Night eighty. It was, it was <laughs> past the hundred. No, uh, no. but we're sitting on a rooftop, and there's all these kegs for senior night. And I had David Wallachinsky's history of the Olympics, and I'm trying to memorize past hundred meter champions because I had to fly up to NBC, get interviewed, and then graduate. So drinking in the Olympics, it all kind of goes. Well, that does kind of come bring you full circle, <laughs> oh. doesn't it? But, you know, is there something about the time spent there or things that you learned standing up twice, you know, Patrick Ewing, that, <laughs> that, that you bring here with you to these Well, to these what games. I loved about Georgetown, the law school, which is, you know, different campus than the undergrad, the law, but you, were, you, were, you felt like you were in the thick of it. Mm. You're right by the Supreme Court. You're right near the Capitol. Washington is such a great transient city. You meet from people from all different states, all different countries. It's just an exciting place to be in the nation's capital and to be there for law school. That, that to me, was always a blast. And I met one of my first Olympians. My classmate was Nancy Hogsett. Ah. And she was there at the same time I was there. There have been quite a few, actually, Hoyas yeah. uh, represented all throughout the games. What about you? Is there something you bring with you? Um... A, a little bit of Pete, uh, immersed in D.C. Uh, I will say, though I was a, a decent student uh, in college, I, I truly understood and appreciated how important it was to work really, really hard to succeed. And uh, that first year at Georgetown Law School was... It's a grind. That was mm -hmm. more than 100, 100 days. It wasn't drinking, though. Uh, <laughs> And I, you know, I think back on on that. That He's was all serious. That was a sure. that was a serious training ground yeah. um, for a lot. But yeah. uh, I'm sure most law schools require that. In any event, Georgetown was a, a great environment for that. I, I think we're all grateful at NBC for Georgetown for producing the three of you and somehow sending you our way. I, 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 I'm the, I, Pete and I are the newbies relative to that. Yeah, so I, I need to give it. a shout out because we've got an alum who's going to be working on air for um, for NBC These Olympics, Monica McNutt, who yes. played for the women's basketball team, is going to be calling um, international basketball games. And she and I stayed in touch, that Georgetown connection. And um, I was so really excited to call her and say, guess what? You get to be an NBC That's Olympian, me. so it's really cool. Yeah, it is kind of interesting how once you start, you, you work the Olympic Games, you, you don't really feel like an Olympian, but you kind of do. Kind of do. You kind of do. It's it's a it's a it's a badge of honor to work on Olympic Games. You're part of Team USA in a yeah, way. In a way. Yeah, in yeah. a way. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and that is kind of one of the nice things too. And I'll I'll ask this before we go because I, I'm genuinely curious to see what you'll say. In my experiences at the Olympic Games, I feel as though it's okay for me as a sports journalist and announcer to be really focused on Team USA and kind of like excited for them and with them. Um, I wouldn't say that it makes me less engaged with any other country, but it almost feels like, I mean, that's our audience, right? Yeah. Uh, the US. Yes, and I think there's a lot of magic in an Olympics. Part of it is there's one home team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We are all rooting for the same home team, and I don't think we have ever shied away. Uh, in fact, not just shied away. We focus on this on this U.S. team uh, from games to games, and it is you know there's there's a an underlying um, 
you know, bringing the world together, maybe a little bit of bringing the country together, even if it's 17 days at a time when there's so much disconnection. Uh, it's the team and the athletes that come from every corner of this country. And uh, there's something special about that. And I think it'll be extremely mm -hmm. special at this games. Yeah, I think when you're doing a Sunday night football game, you have to maintain your objectivity. Correct. Here, here you don't. Here it's, you don't. It's kind you of can a be a homer. Right? It's a kind exactly. Yeah. You can kind of be a homer, and it's kind of a beautiful thing yep. to walk out of the the swimming each night and say. I, I, Wow, I, I just got you to feel see, like you're a part of yes. It too. Yeah. I just got yeah. to see Michael Phelps, Katie Ledet, whatever it was. Um, it's the beauty of the Olympic Games on NBC, and you guys, thanks so much, um, Pete Bavakwa, Molly Salmon, uh, Gary Zenkel, and you'll all want to tune in to the Tokyo Olympic Games. Uh, like they said, seven thousand hours across all these different networks of NBC Universal and coverage of the very important and emotional opening, opening ceremony. Opening ceremony, July 23rd, Friday, 7.30 p.m. Eastern. And Georgetown will not require any studying or work for two weeks. That is a I'm night sure off at some. Georgetown. That's what we've been told unofficially. And, and we're starting a petition to get you an honorary degree. Thank you. I would appreciate that. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone at Georgetown.